Hi, my name is John Cash. I'm the CEO and chairman of the board for UR Energy. We are a U.S.-based uranium producer focused on projects in Wyoming. We have the up and running uh, Lost Creek Mine that's been in production since 2013, and we're currently ramping production up there to commercial levels. We've also made the announcement that we're building out a second mine called Shirley Basin. It will also be in Wyoming as an in situ mine. Uh, right now, our mine capacity is licensed at 1.2 million pounds per year. But as we bring on Shirley Basin, the late 2025, early 26 timeframe, we'll actually take our production capacity up to 2.2 million pounds per year. The last several quarters, we've been the largest producer in the U.S., and uh, we've been very fortunate to sign a number of very good-priced long-term contracts with the U.S. and European utilities. Sean, good to see you, good to see you. Right, we're a bit of a pregnant pause with uh, Uranium, but there's lots to like, there's lots to like. Why don't we start off with your Q3 numbers, please? And I, then I want to kind of roll it out and say, obviously, there's a, an event happened recently, earlier this week, which I wouldn't mind uh, trying to understand the implications of. But first of all, Q3 results. Yeah, uh, we just this week came out with our Q3 numbers, uh, some good news, some bad news. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, we do continue to ramp up production at Lost Creek quarter over quarter. Our production continues to, to climb, uh, but we have struggled a little bit with the speed of ramp up. It's not where we want it to be, and we're striving every day uh, to speed up that ramp up uh, to produce as many pounds as we can from Lost Creek. Uh, we do keep making progress. Uh, we have our drill rigs now. That's been a struggle that we've talked about in the past, but we have all of our rigs and we have sufficient people, it's just a matter of continuing to train, uh, grow in that efficiency, and continue to ramp up production. Shirley Basin, a great story there. Construction there is on schedule, and uh, we're looking at bringing it online uh, late next year, very early 26 in, in that time frame. Uh, but our work plan for this year is almost done. Uh, next week, we're going to finish up one uh, pump test. That's our second pump test but we'll finish it up next week. And uh, then essentially we'll uh, be working on engineering over the winter and by spring of next year, uh, maybe April, we'll see where the snow melts off. Uh, but around April, we'll break ground to build out that satellite plant. Uh, and, and for the listeners, it is just a, a small satellite plant. We're not building out a full facility there because Lost Creek is not very far away. So we have the ability to simply uh, load resin into trucks ship it about 100 miles over to Lost Creek for processing there, and that keeps our capital cost down at Shirley Basin. Uh, the build out of that facility all in, we're looking at about $41 million between now and the time we go into production uh, late next year, early 26. So uh, firing on all cylinders there. Okay, well, look, one of the very few producing in, in the U.S., and, and again, refer, you know, I think the, the U.S. feels like it's um, prime to the pumps for um, nuclear at the moment. This ramp up, are you being hard on yourself or is there a, a genuine cause for concern when it comes to, you know, this quarter, quarter and quarter build out not happening to uh, as expected? Yeah, I am certain we are harder on ourselves than uh, the investor community is. Um, yeah, putting out the press release last night in the quarterly, uh, we were feeling pretty low about that, but the investors have given us a, a relatively positive response on that. Hey, we know ramp up is difficult stick with it. You're getting there and we are getting there. So no, uh, my team, uh, especially my senior management team, we uh, have a lot of years of experience with mining production. So when we don't hit our targets, we take it really personally and uh, we don't feel very good about that, but we are getting there and we've got great support from our shareholders. So we'll keep pushing the rock up the hill. Okay. I feel you're being too hard on yourself. Because look, I think not too many people are rushing to get into production. I, I'm, I'm looking globally, right? And the, and the ones that have have had the same thing. And I think long called by you know people people like John Porsche, who, who you know very very well, uh, Mark Chalmers as well. It, it's not easy. It's technical. Um, so a lot of people to, in the comfort of talking about it, not actually having to do it. You've done it. So if if we look at um, the the things on the ground that that you have come up against? I mean, what, what what do you look at? What are the things you kind of look at and you say to your team, look, we've got to be on top of this? Yeah. So there's been a shortage of manpower for drill rigs. That has slowed the ramp up, no doubt. But we do have our rigs now. They have their people. Uh, there's been a shortage of people for hourly staff and professionals for direct hires for us. Uh, we're working our way through that bit by bit. We do have uh, a full contingency now of staff at the site. 
a uh, little bit of turnover that we're dealing with. So we keep training and then retraining, uh, but that is getting better. It's improving uh, bit by bit as we establish a long-term workforce. So those are the challenges. We've had some mechanical issues that are very short-lived and par for the course that we work our way through. And uh, But yeah, those are the factors that are slowing things down. We keep taking uh, two steps forward, half a step back, uh, but then the next day we'll take another two steps forward and we're getting there bit by bit. It's interesting actually, this, as people could put it, I mean, it's, it's long been sort of mentioned in conversation, but very speedily people move on to the next topic. The skilled labor component in a sector which hasn't really been up to much for the last 10 years since yeah, Fukushima, um, et cetera. Do you, do you think that you're starting to see, whether it be sort of mining engineers more more broadly, uh, drill operators on, on the ground and specific to uranium. Do you think that if, if you're struggling, what's going to happen to the people behind you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've mopped up pretty much everybody that has any experience in the industry and uh, they're working for us now here in the U S uh, I mean, there are some great people working for other companies that have some great experience too. So I want to acknowledge that, but as far as bringing any other people in back into the industry, uh, I think we're pretty well done with that. Uh, there are no other people to hire and bring back in, uh, or maybe very limited onesies, twosies here and there. But by and large, I think the industry here in the U.S., as we grow, we're going to have to bring in new and experienced people and get them trained up over time. And that's where we are with UR Energy. We've brought in some really fantastic people, uh, but they're inexperienced. And it's going to take a few months, maybe a year, to get them uh, fully up to speed and trained. In situ mining is uh, really there's no great analog to it with conventional mining. The skill sets are quite unique. And so there is no in situ university where we can go and hire an in situ engineer or an in situ geologist. It really is a matter of taking people from other uh, sectors, uh, oil and gas, other types of mining, bringing them in and pairing them up with someone who's experienced to get them trained up. So it takes time, but we're getting there. And as far as rigs, we I think we're at the beginning of the end. There are some uh, some experience growing in now, and so I think that issue is resolving itself. Uh, we're not at the end of that issue, but I think we're at the beginning of the end as uh, more and more rigs are becoming available. Right. So let's let's talk about what you think you're going to deliver by the end of the year. Is this going to impact on your on your guidance? Yeah. So uh, we have updated our guidance uh, around two hundred sixty thousand pounds plus or minus there uh, for production this year and we're going to continue to ramp up going into next year uh, we've not issued any f official guidance for next year but our contract book is at seven hundred forty thousand pounds we'd love to be able to produce that next year to fill those contracts so <clears throat> we will fill our contracts this year no question about that uh, but we are having to look at options uh, outside just production to be able to do that we've been really clear in the last couple of quarterly reports that those options are out there and we're exploring those. So uh, they're available to us. We're not in danger of defaulting on our deliveries. Right. In terms of revenue and margins, is that and, and cash in the bank, cash in hand or, or, or um, any other kind of liquid assets that you've got, are you going to be able to fund this continued growth and ramp up and obviously the development of, of Shirley Basin? without raising money. So right now we have $110 million in cash as uh, recorded in the Q3 report. Uh, beyond that, this calendar year, we'll have about $33.1 million in revenue. The vast majority of that will be from deliveries late this year. So that money will come in late this year. Some may spill over a little bit into very, very early next year. So we do have good revenue uh, coming in from that. So we're in a good, strong position on cash. We have no debt and uh, we've you know, we'll continue to use that cash for ramp up at Lost Creek and more importantly for the build out at Shirley Basin. And so, yeah, I don't believe we have any need to raise money in the near term. Uh, we're very well cashed up with no debt and with revenue coming in. So it's and a bit of a unique some... story for a junior mining company. <laughs> yeah, you're bucking the trend. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so, so it's really the kind of margin that you're you're seeing at, at these prices and how you expect that to evolve now. And, and that's going to be in the context of, you know, spot prices doing one thing, uh, term contracts are, are doing something else. But the general trend 
tell me it's going up. Yeah, so the contract book, uh, each time we sign a contract, it's at higher and higher and higher prices. I mean, deliveries this year, we're going to be a little over $60 a pound on average. But keep in mind, when we signed those contracts, the price of uranium was uh, dramatically lower than it is right now. It was you know $50 a pound or so, $45 a pound. And so we actually got a really nice premium uh, when we signed those contracts. So we continue to see RFPs coming in from utilities. Uh, we respond to those as is appropriate with uh, higher and higher pricing as the long-term market has stayed really strong. And so uh, our cost of production right now is not where we want it to be because we're not ramped up. And But as we continue to ramp up and as we reach those economies of scale, we're gonna have a very nice margin between our production cost and our contract uh, price especially as we begin to move through time and we begin to uh, come into those higher and higher price contracts. Okay, so if I'm looking at your contract book for next year and you said, I'm sure we hope to be able to deliver against that, was it, was it 750 ish? 740, yep. 740 number, right? And, it is, and you also contracted out, but how far out are you contracted for, for your current production levels? So right now our contract book goes out through 2033 but I can tell you the book it really peaks right now at around 2029 and then begins uh, to come back down. Uh, 2829 is where we peak and then we come back down. Uh, we'll work to fill that in the outlying years. Uh, we're, we're patient now, waiting to see how the market evolves and develops. Uh, we believe that uh, the price is going to continue to rise in the, the uh, long-term market, especially for domestic U.S. producers. Uh, the Department of Energy has uh, has let their contracts now for the HALU proper project. They've named four enrichers. Uh, we have relationships with all four of those enrichers. There is a preference for U.S. production to fill that, and it's a significant quantity. It's hard to calculate exactly how much uh, because the DOE hasn't put out all of the information yet, but it could easily be over two, even two and a half million pounds per year uh, that will feed into that program. So. We're hoping to sign some contracts up uh, to participate in that HALU program and uh, you know, pay, get a premium price for those pounds because they're domestic. And domestic pounds are in very, very short supply. There are very few of us uh, that are ramping up. I don't even need one hand uh, to count all the companies that are attempting to ramp up right now. Okay, so you're going to move um, from where you are now to 2.2 million pound production but at some point early to mid-2026. So currently, I assume all of your production is contracted. When do you get to the point, when you think you're going to get to the point where you'll have available uncontracted pounds to put into the market? Oh, we already have uh, quite a bit of room that's uncontracted right now. If you look over the next six years, uh, probably about half of our uh, capacity for production is unbooked. So unhedged. So there's a lot of room to continue to sell if we want uh, going forward. If we do make that decision, we are increasingly pushing toward contracts that have market related provisions with floors and ceilings so that uh, we continue to have uh, a blue sky and exposure to a market. A little softening right now on the spot. Uh, we think that's short term. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of the reasons uh, behind that. And so we think in the coming weeks, that'll find a bottom not too far from where it is right now, and there will be upward movement. Uh, so that's kind of our strategy on contracting. Uh, but yeah, a lot of room to continue to grow that contract book with pounds that um, we have the capacity for that are fully licensed and permitted, and especially as we complete construction on Shirley Basin and bring it into production. Right. Obviously, you, you're more concerned about you know, contracting prices and add that flexibility around some of the, the, the terms than spot price. But I think retail and maybe maybe you know other types of investors are looking at that spot price. It, it, it seems um, looking at the sort of volatility um, that we've we've seen this year alone. Can we can you just dig into a little bit to these these contracts that you will get you a know, um, with with these RFPs which which are, which will come in. The flexibility there is that a, is that a new thing? Was it always did the contracts these term contracts always have that kind of flexibility built in? And if so, yeah, you know, why would you just sign term contracts? Why would you? Why do some companies like the thought of being able to 
sell into the spot? Yeah, you know, it's a great question and things change over time depending on where the market uh, price is, depending on supply demand fundamentals, where the shortfall is. Um, I would say for a number of years, the uh, buyers were essentially in control. It was a buyer's market because there was plenty of supply and prices were incredibly low. So buyers had the ability to demand things like flex, like optionality, like delivery dates. However, as the, uh, the, the situation has developed here, we're seeing a, a bigger and bigger gap between supply and demand. And now it is a seller's market. And so do the mining companies, do they have to accept optionality uh, demands from the buyers? No. Uh, that has really changed. So I can't speak for all other companies, but I think generally there is a trend toward not accepting optionality, uh, i.e. Uh, extending contracts for two, three, four years at the option of the buyer. I think that's pretty much off the table at this point. Uh, flex, where the buyer has the option of flexing up or down depending on their needs. I think that is largely off the table now. So it's really become a, a, a seller's market and the sellers, the mining companies are really driving the discussion. Um, so I think uh, there's differences in strategy between companies. Some companies like to be unhedged. They like that exposure uh, to the spot market. Uh, that can work out really well, or it can work out really poorly, depending on where the spot price goes. Uh, the strategy that we have always uh, employed here at, Law at UR Energy is we'd like to contract out 40 50, 60 percent um, of our book our production capacity, leave some of it open to exposure to the spot market. But having said that, if a utility is willing to sign a contract with us that is uh, market related, that we can lock in some really high priced floors, then yeah, we'll contract out an even higher percentage and lock in those contracts. Um, many uh, mining companies have talked about this in the recent months. Uh, the difference between the spot market and the term market, there's a big difference. The uh, spot market, that typically is more bankers, um, funds, uh, trusts, uh, traders that dabble there. Typically, it's not the utilities that play there. The utilities really prefer to be signing contracts in the long-term market. So there is a big difference on who plays in which market. Um, and, and that's important to recognize. There can be a lot of excitement and uh, volatility in the spot market, but does that really have much of an impact on the utilities? No, not really, because they play on the other side. They play in the long-term market. So roughly 85% of the market is the term market. Only about 15% or so is on the spot market. And so a lot of investors don't recognize it. Uh, but yeah, there can be a lot of excitement up and down uh, as people watch that spot market, but really the real market is the term. 15%. That, that's I've not heard that number before, and I've been talking about this for five years. That's interesting. Because um, if I'm sort of look, looking at maybe price reaction and, and, and reaction um, in, in um, the last year or so, it feels like we're in this transition from buyer's market to seller's market, but they, both sides still have a little bit of uh, they have they have they have a few they have a lot to say about it, or otherwise this thing be ripping into what the what the pom pom pushers uh, would suggest is you know it's two three hundred bucks uh, territory and it's and it's not there yet. It's kind of it's a kind of considered move forward and let's say two steps forward, one step back on occasion. Um, can I talk? Can I talk about some of the other influences? I'm, I'm desperate to talk to you about the U.S. You're you're, you're in the U.S. U.S. citizen, you've just been through this election. The nuclear space felt like it was bipartisan, um, and, and maybe it didn't. It's, it's a case of it doesn't matter who who got into power or stayed in power. Um, are you getting any early indications? Do you some thoughts about what the impact of of Trump coming back in as as number forty seven? And what that's going to do for you? Yeah, no, it's a great question and something we think about an awful lot. I think uh, a couple of different things to look at here. Number one is uh, what's the impact on nuclear power, electric generation in the U.S. and geopolitics? And I think in that regard, there's probably not a lot of daylight between the Republican and the Democrat parties. Uh, they're pretty similar on their stance. Keep in mind uh, on the Russian ban that was just implemented a few months ago, that was a unanimous vote. 
and was signed off uh, by uh, President Biden. Uh, we just there's almost nothing that the two parties agree on, but that was unanimous. So I think that's a strong indication of the uh, geopolitical support and uh, the consensus that we see in Washington, D.C. Uh, when it comes to Russia in particular. I think the sentiment with China is very similar. There's not much love right now for China uh, in Washington, D.C. So I don't think we should expect to see um, a lot of imports coming out of China uh, into the U.S. going forward. I think uh, Congress or the uh, Department of Commerce will step in and prevent that from happening to a very large degree. So that's the answer on, on the back end. On the front end, it's a little bit different. Uh, there are some notable differences between the two parties. Uh, for example, uh, President Trump in his first term, uh, he put uranium on the critical minerals list, which gave some uh, advantages to permitting timelines. Uh, they were meaningful. Uh, but when President Biden came into office, he removed uranium from the critical minerals list. I hope, I would expect, that President Trump would put uranium back on the critical minerals list. Uh, and that could be uh, beneficial to us uh, as we permit projects going forward, not just for us, uh, but any uh, uranium company in the U.S. Uh, beyond that, uh, President Trump is likely going to be more supportive of mining activities and mining law uh, as it is uh, versus a Harris administration that probably would have tried to advance a number of changes. Um, whether those changes are good or bad, changes are oftentimes difficult to deal with and manage. You often hear uh, CEOs say, uh, we can handle a lot, but we don't like change. And I would say that's similar here is we can handle a lot, but we don't like change. Uh, making uh, changes to regulatory regime and structure, uh, management of federal lands, things like that is always challenging for us because we've established our company and our philosophies, our game plan based on the existing regulatory regime. So any change is difficult to adjust to. And so we would expect to see fewer changes under a Trump administration. So uh, I think uh, on the front end, uh, the election bodes well for uranium miners in the U.S. It'll be more status quo. It's, it's interesting, actually, listening to Trump um, and his acceptance speech. He mentioned nuclear specifically, um, but but the kind of the, the big driver was energy. He sees energy as the solution to all businesses' problems and rising energy costs. Um, for for industry, for, uh, for business, for for homeowners, um, nuclear is part of that solution. It it it, it, it seems uh, so is oil. Drill, drill, drill. He says. Um, do you think that that means that they're going to expedite matters? Because he, he's really like he's got four years. It's not like you know he's got the potential of eight years. He's got four years to do to you know maybe fix the energy. Uh, pricing issues. Is that going to help you? Um, or it, it does the problem of you know how they come at the mining element of the energy solutions for our, as uranium companies are concerned? Yeah, I don't know that uh, the this administration, the upcoming administration, will make that many changes to policy or law. But what I do think we will see that's going to be incredibly helpful for every sector of energy generation, production, is getting the bureaucracy out of the way. And uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see how President Trump handles that. I mean, he's talked about bringing Elon Musk in. Uh, he's a wild man, uh, he's awesome, but bringing him in kind of as an efficiency czar and uh, to reduce costs. So looking forward to those improved efficiencies, get rid of that bureaucracy. Uh, there's no reason why regulators can't make decisions quicker based on the information that they have. Uh, instead of dragging their feet. So looking forward to seeing that happen. But that's that's going to be an effect on, on every industry, oil and gas, nuclear, uh, coal, uh, whether it be fossil fuels or whether it be renewables, uh, getting the bureaucracy out of the way so the market can be making decisions uh, is going to be incredibly helpful. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about the kind of cost-cutting um, plants. Um, I'd love some over here as well. We, we, could, we could do with an Elon Musk over here in, the, in Europe too. Um, well, like John, it, it, it sounds like, you know, it, everything's moving forward. Um, the ramp up to 2.2 million pounds is exciting. It's not easy. Um, but, and maybe it's a salutary lesson to investors to when they're listening to companies talk, talk an easy game. 
Um, the reality is somewhat different, but you continue to deliver. So appreciate your time. Stay in touch and let us know how you get on, okay? Will do. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate the time.